Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. We're here today to uh, speak with Iris Apfel and uh, Massimo Alloy and Anthony Chinami, the uh, publisher of the Wall Street Journal, uh, to discuss their family connection uh, and the many years of, of history that go back from the beginning of Old World Weavers with uh, your family and then um, to also talk about how you've um, rebuilt the vineyards uh, in the region of Caserta and, and uh, how, how, hear some stories of, of you both being together. I, as a little boy, coming from, my parents are from Caserta, they're expat Italians who live in the United States, and we spent every summer on vacation in Italy, and I, I thought that I had a wonderful childhood, and I, a lot of my life is very, very positive, because I've, I've only been exposed to the positive. And as a little boy, visiting Caserta, which is the ancestral village of my parents, we would visit there's a palace in Caserta called the Royal Palace of Caserta. The architect was Van Vitelli, and it was, it was built by Bourbon kings when they were in control uh, of the kingdom of, of the two Sicilies, or the kingdom of Napoli, which was what it was also known as. And visiting this palace as a little boy, seven, eight years old, and running through its corridors, and in those days it was the early 70s, and we were more, allowed more access to the palace than we are today, especially if you came from the area and you knew people. But we were always allowed, and I used to sit on the lions at the, at the bottom of the staircase, and everybody would see these pictures of me on the lions and say, but where are you? Are you in France? I was like, no, I'm not in France. I'm in Caserta. It looks like Versailles. And they were like, but what are you doing with the palace like that? And I, was, I would actually ask these questions over and over again as a little boy. And my father would talk to me about how there were kings that lived here and how there were queens that lived here. And then we went up a few feet higher up a hill to an area that he was in love with because it had a beautiful view. It actually, it's called Belvedere. And it's known as San Leocho. And San Leocho is surrounded by amazing mulberry trees. And my father would explain to me that the mulberry trees would create silk and that the people that lived there were amazing silk makers. And I'm like, what's a silk maker? He goes, well, the shirts that you have and the shirts that I have in the days in the early 70s, silk shirts were big. Exactly. However, these are not silks that you wear. These are silks that were adorned on major palaces uh, throughout the whole world. The people who lived here created textiles and design for very privileged, wealthy people throughout the country, which we don't have in the United States. But you see a lot of Americans who are, are very obsessed with royalty. And I said, I'm one of those Americans that was obsessed with royalty. And I fell in love with this area and rediscovered it. And then about two years ago, I tasted a wine that I really enjoyed very much. And it came from the same village from where my parents were from, actually from the other side of the hill. And it's from a little area called Ponte Latone. <laughs> and I went and visited Ponte Latone. And on the drive there, I was like, this is one of the most amazing drives. It was clean. It was pristine. There were Roman ruins hidden in certain areas. There was limestone and volcanic. And I knocked on the door of this vineyard. And I met Massimo Alois. <laughs> and he was really, really charming. And I said, Alois. And I looked up the name Alois. And I remember my father talking to me about them. And they were known, the townspeople would call them i signori. And i signori, I don't know if it really exists anymore in that town, but it, it really refers to people who are somewhat aristocratic. But in, in Massimo's case, it's really aristocratic because his, his lineage actually comes from aristocratic people who were part of the royal court of Caserta. So the vineyard that he is on was actually, redis there were grapes that were rediscovered by his father about 30, 40 years ago, Palagrello grapes and, 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 and Casavecchia grapes. And I tasted these wines and I listened to his stories and I was, I was completely transported and I very much enjoyed it because wine cannot be enjoyed just by standing and drinking wine at a cocktail. You need to eat it with food and you need to have an experience with it. And when I met him at his vineyard, he took us down into his cantina, and in his cantina, below the ground, he had all these books that housed invoices from major American and international companies that would buy silks, and one of them was Old World Weavers. 
And old world, world weavers, it brought to mind, it was like, oh, I was Apfel. She was old world weavers. Tell me about what you did. And he said, well, she used to come here and she discovered our silk factories and brought them to America during the Truman era. During what? The Truman era. Yeah. The Truman era, correct. So I, I thought as publisher of, of WSJ Magazine, it would be really nice to do this favor since we've all become friends and to hear these stories more today and what the story is behind Massimo. So I brought David Scott, who's a renowned interior designer and, and a very good friend, Iris Apfel, who we all know as a fashion icon and interior designer and a search engine for her friends and family. She's not on the internet. She doesn't do email. She converses with people. And I think that conversing with people is much more effective than anything in digital. And of course, Massimo Aloys, who's an eighth descendant? Uh, yeah, I would say maybe the tenth. Tenth. Yeah, tenth. Tenth descendant. So tell us a little bit more about your background, Massimo. Yeah, I mean, uh, the Aloys family originally came from France in the 16th century. And then they actually were part of the nobility, as you said, you know, of the Bourbon kings, because the Bourbon kings came in the 18th century, and uh, we were part of their, their royal court. And uh, the, the, the Bourbon kings were always competing with the French, so that's why they created, they built this big factory for making uh, the, the fabrics for the garments of the lady of the court. And the Lloyd's family was in charge of this manufacturing plant that they built in San Leucho, which is a small town, it's a close city, uh, close to the royal palace of Caserta. And so we have always been making fabrics, you know. And uh, we got to know, you know, the, the Apfel family, you know, after the Second World War. So we've been in the silk uh, business for more than uh, two centuries, actually. Can, can you tell us how uh, specifically how your grandfather uh, Giovanni came to uh, meet the Apples? Yeah, uh, actually, I'm happy to share, you know, what I understand as the first meeting. But uh, Iris and Carl actually uh, came to know my grandfather uh, longer than uh, me because. Um, since uh, my grandfather died one year uh, before I was born. Mm. And uh, I remember, you know, uh, having, um, I mean, I remember them coming over, you know, to the, um, to, to Salencio, you know, and spent time with us. And, you know, at that time, I think it was not that the connection, I mean, the transportation was not that, uh, that comfortable, you know, and... Uh, yeah, speaking of transportation, um, Iris, uh, as you actually met Massimo's uh, grandfather in person, can you talk about arriving in Caserta uh, by ship and being picked up in a carriage by Mr. Alois? I remember it vaguely. I don't remember Grandpa too well because I knew his uncle quite well, who was really quite a character. Angelina. He, and Angelina, his wife, was a beautiful lady who was one of the best cooks I've ever come upon, and she also used to tell me, you better eat. Oh, uh, this is very funny because I, the plates would be sp stacked up, and you'd start at the top, you know, maybe there'd be 10 plates, and I, I had the misfortune to, the first time, say, oh God, this is delicious. Immediately, a second portion of the same thing. So I learned not to compliment anything because I gain about 12 pounds at every sitting. <laughs> Anyway, not only that, but sometimes I just, she would stuff me so I couldn't, I couldn't handle it. So she gave me something called, at the end of every meal, they took out a bottle of Herbamil. It was a, uh, a digestive medication, which they subsequently took off the market because they found that <laughs> it contained some morphine, oh. which was very Italian in those days. And what days were those? Well, this was in the 50s. Everything was so, we, we came to Italy the first time with, uh, did you know the Bologna family? No. Well, he was a really master weaver. He was absolutely sensational. He came over, I guess he must have come in the late 40s or the 50s, and he brought some looms with him, and he set up 
a little uh, place of his own in uh, Patterson, where a lot of silk people were working. And he would weave the most divine fabrics for French and Company, and he started to sell to Scalamandre and whatnot. And uh, he didn't like that at all. He wanted his own business. And subsequent, I, I met, by, fe by chance, I met his daughter at school. And she used to tell me about him and uh, tell me how wonderful he was. And some years later, when I was in the interior design business, I wanted a fabric which didn't exist. I had it in my head. And I went to every fabric source in New York, and nobody had it. And I was tearing my hair. And I ran into her. And I told her my problem. And she said, well, why don't you uh, bring the sketch over to Papa, go over to the mill in Long Island City. And if he likes it, he'll weave it for you. So I did, and he did, and he wove it. And it was a big success. And so he said, do you have any more designs? And I said, oh, I have a few. And I brought some, and he loved them, and he made them, and they were very successful. So he said, how would you like to go into business with me? I don't want to weave for other people. I want to weave for myself. I'll manage the mill. You do the designing, and your husband can do the business. So we kicked it around, and it was a big decision because we didn't have money at the time. And uh, it was a, anyway, we decided to do it. And we did, and uh, lots of funny stories about that. But I wanted to get back to Caserta because the first time we went, it was a gorgeous drive. I remember, too. There were trees lined. I, I, they subsequently horribly cut them all down. There were these trees that arched. And you went for miles under the tree. Oh, it was so pretty. And Caserta was a really nothing town, and there wasn't a decent hotel. So we always stayed in Naples and drove in. Anyway, the very first day. It's still like that. I'm sorry? It's still like that, unless you stay with Massimo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, well, we stayed at the Excelsior, which was uh, so, yeah. so many stories about that. I became the official. We used to stay for two or three weeks at a time, and nobody, no Americans ever stayed that long in Naples. And so we were kind of freaks, and they took a shine to me. And so I, I loved to go there because I had a private office. I mean, they gave me the, everything was at my disposal, including, <laughs> including the hotel bus. And I would toot around shopping on the bus. And I'm a great creeper, and I'm a black belt chopper. And a black I, belt chopper. Yeah, and I used to find terrific things which caught the eye of guys who worked there. So they would prepare lists of what they needed and wait for me to come and do their shopping. We had so much fun. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a, uh, a young man who was the uh, in charge of baggage. What, what did they call him? Uh, um, a portiniere. Yeah, I think so, yeah. No, so whatever it was. And he was... How do we say portiniere in English? A bus bellboy. Yeah. No, he uh, wasn't a bellboy. He was in charge of... Uh, he was the top bellman, let's say. Anyway, he was a great shopper, and he thought he knew everything about Naples. And he kept promising me that there was this wonderful place he was going to one day take me to, because I, it was the, I, he knew I was a good creeper, but he said this was impossible to find. So finally the day came, and we're going down the steps of this hell hole, and the guy said, ah, Senora Hopperfell, because <laughs> I'd already found it. He was so crushed, it was funny. Oh, that's hysterical. <laughs> so you knew before the, the concierge of the hotel. Anyway, uh, we were taken, the first day we got to Caserta, <coughs> to, uh, to the palace grounds. They were still working on the palace. And they wanted to serve us lunch. And they, the kitchen wasn't ready, so we ate in the garden. And I'll never forget that, because it was unbelievable that the first, I was starving. And the first course was pasta with a red sauce. And I was used to little dogs or coming around the table begging. But I never saw ducks do it. And the ducks would come and quack away until you gave them some pasta. And the red sauce was running down their bill. <laughs> I never forget that as long as I live. And then, and then we went in. They said, well, it was under construction, but they allowed a few people in, and they would take us around. And there was a family of uh, a, a 
a working cl very a working class family. You could see they didn't have very much. There was the mama and papa and a bunch of kids. And Papa was all puffed up, and he came over and he said, in a broken accent, he knew that I was American and we had lots of great things, but you ain't a got this. They were so proud of the fact that they had the palace mm. and what a treasure it was. That's an indelible memory. I'll never forget that. Now it's UNESCO protected. As is the Setaioli uh, on Sun Leo show, they're both UNESCO protected. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Are the are the mills still there? Yeah, yeah, a bunch of those are still there. Yes, yes, they are. And let me just add something, you know, to what Iris was saying, that for us, whenever they came over, was always a big feast. It was always a big party, because you know we had the Americans coming over, and don't forget we are just we were at the, uh, after the Second World War, and for us, you know, I mean, the American rescued us, you know. So it was also that had a social impact as well. And then we were creating fabrics with them, you know, because they were, they were bringing new ideas, new pattern, uh, new designs. And then we were actually selling fabrics to them and selling fabrics, you know, through them to the White House. I mean, for us, I mean, it was just astonishing. And, and how did you come about to um, make that choice uh, to uh, select their fabrics to use in the White House and to kind of you were able to travel all over the world to find fabrics from why did you choose um, well their there fabrics? were certain fabrics that certain mills could do I mean every mill can do every kind of fabric and there were many uh, people don't understand about uh, restorations Jackie Kennedy did not do the White House uh, nobody does the White House. Uh, to, to be historically accurate, a restoration has to be done as closely as possible, even if it's hideous to the way it was. You can't come in and change it. And so we had some of the original swatches from the White House. And I always tried not to redesign or to uh, just get an inspiration from. I replicated the fabrics as closely as close as we could possibly get it. And they made beautiful quality at, at the mill. And uh, my husband and I always, our work and our life was one and the same. And we liked to work with people we liked. And we got friendly with all these people. I mean, we're, a lot of the other buyers just came and left. We were always invited to home and met the family and it was a lot of fun. Your when, uncle when, when loved the first? bargain. You remember? Yeah. Maybe you were too young. He, he, whatever there was that he could find that was very cheap, he would buy a ton of, literally. He had a huge, he had a terrace, which was about this size, wasn't it? it was yeah, huge. yeah, yeah, it was huge. And one year we came and we couldn't get on the terrace, it was piled high with socks. He was telling my husband he got this great seal on socks. So we bought, another year it was piled high with apples. I mean, whatever he could find, he was just terrific. And he was a very good uh, weaver, and uh, as I say, his wife, was terrific, and she would tell me, when I know you're coming, I'm cooking for 10 days, mm -hmm. and I take it as a personal insult if you don't eat everything. <laughs> what was your favorite dish? Oh, God, they were all so good, all so good. But that's where the herbal milk came in, because if I didn't have that, I would well, have collapsed. You got to the morphine. Oh, my gosh, it was the morphine <laughs> that did it. <laughs> right. And then... Uh, and she used to make nochilla. She would go up, yeah. you, know, you know that. So, the walnuts, walnuts. Uh, not the hazelnut. No, walnut. Walnuts, you go up on the it's roof. Walnuts uh, liquor. And it, it, it ferments in the sun. It was delicious. And then, uh, I mean, David, I would say that then w one of the reasons why uh, the Americans used to come over is uh, because we pioneered the jacquard uh, technique weave. So the fabrics that we were producing were not print fabrics. They were, the design was the result of the intersection of the vertical and horizontal uh, uh, threads. So the weft and the warp. So it was not a print. So that's why the looms that we had were that big that we could reproduce big scale designs. That's why our fabrics are hanging on the walls of pretty important palaces all around the world and the White House as well. So that was a pretty, uh, you know, uh, important 
and uh, difficult technique, so it was not easy to weave uh, such, uh, such a fabric. They did beautiful work, and we were told that the, uh, the Bourbon Kings had brought French weavers originally mm -hmm. so to set trained. up the whole works, yeah. because they wanted beautiful kind of things, and France made such beautiful fabrics. So it became part of your family's culture. Yeah, 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 yes it is. So we've been, uh, you know, working uh, with the Bourbon Kings, you know, during that period. And then um, even after, you know, Italy was united, I think the, the Piedmontese, you know, the kings who took over Italy, you know, with the French, uh, they made a big mistake uh, getting rid uh, of all those people who were you know, gravitating around the Bourbon Kings, and uh, they made a big mistake in destroying, a, you know, uh, most of the things that Bourbon Kings uh, made. But then, after a few years, you know, there was in the in the in the seventies, you know, eighteen seventies, eighteen seventy five, they tried to to call all these people back. And so, for example, to us, they gave us an entire mountain called Monte Briano. It's just close to the Royal Palace of Caserta. Now it's the, it's a WWF, WWF, uh, you know, resort. And uh, we used to take the wood to light the fire for our tanks because at the, at the time the yarns were dyed in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in this kind of tanks, you know, so there was not electricity. So they tried to, to bring all those people back. And so the Alois family, you know, started again in uh, 1885, the production of silk uh, fabrics. And then how did that evolve into the winemaking? Yeah, I mean, we have always, Iris remembers, we have always made wine, you know. We were gathering around the table, you know, when they were coming. It was always a big party and a big feast. And we were drinking wine all the time. But at the time, we were making wine just for uh, for the family, you know, for our own consumption and for our workers. But then what happened is my father, 30 years ago, he started resurrecting all the, the ancient vines, the indigenous varietals that the Bourbon kings were cultivating in the, royal, uh, in the royal garden. Because close to the royal garden, you know, of Caserta, they created this big uh, vineyard called La Vigna del Ventaglio, which means a fan vineyard because the shape of the vineyard had the shape of a fan with seven different rows and seven different varietals. And they planted the typical varietals, uh, indigenous varietals of northern Campania, such as Palla Grello Bianco and Palla Grello, Palla Grello Nero. So actually they didn't plant the most widely cultivated uh, plants in Campania, but they planted these, you know, varietals that were there in the area. And they repropagated them just because they, did, they couldn't stand the fact that the French were coming over with their own, you know, wines, you know, uh, they wanted to have their own uh, varietals, so that's why they planted that. So my father just resurrected them 30 years ago, because, you know, phylloxera, which is a disease which destroyed all the vineyards, and then we said the Savoia family, you know, the Piedmontese, they destroyed all the vineyards that the Bourbon Kings set was up. Was Raphael involved with Exactly, Raphael was, yeah, Raphael is my grandfather. You know, so Raffaele was, yeah, he was. He was your grandfather? Yeah, Raffaele was my grandfather, and then Raffaele, maybe you mean the, my, my brother's uh, brother, you know? So my, well, Raffaele, my, I, I'm sorry, my father's brother. Raffaele was married to? Angelina. Oh, and he was your grandfather. Y yeah, no, then he I was my it. uncle, I'm sorry. Oh, he your was uncle, my uncle. yes, that's yeah. what you said so before. So Angelina's husband uncle. is my uncle, yeah. And now Antonio, his son, you know, he keeps producing fabrics. You know, that's what he's doing right now. This is your cousin. Yeah, it's, it's my Antonio cousin. Alois. Antonio Alois. Yeah, that's because what he's doing right um, Raphael in the old days made some pretty awful wine. Yeah. yeah. As a matter Actually, of fact, I was, I, was I, I tell you the truth. I loved your wine and I was afraid to drink. I was afraid to open yeah. the bottle. I was let, telling my housekeeper, oh my God, the last time, uh, it was a long, long time ago. Raffaello sent some wine over. My husband said, oh, my God, I'm yeah. afraid it's going to explode yeah, in the bottle. That's totally you know, true. It's we very interesting that you bring that up because yeah. as, a, as, a, as a little boy, you know, you, 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 um, Massimo actually explained how a lot of this was destroyed. It was destroyed, one, through the, the Piedmont family, uh, the House of Savoy, who wanted to destroy vestiges of the Bourbons, so they destroyed grapes, vineyards. Also, phylloxera. 
Phylloxera, which was a fungal disease which came to the south of Italy in the 1890s, destroyed a lot of vines. And then the war. So Massimo brought up the war, and in the 50s, this area of Italy was saved by Americans as Germans were retreating. And, and we, it, it was right at that time when the Italians switched sides during the armistice in September 1943 that our families were very much disrupted yeah. by what was happening between the Allies and the Americans. And when the Germans retreated, they burned a lot of farmland yeah. and they slaughtered all the animals so that it could leave the local population in the hands of the Americans having to take care of them I guess, as a Red Cross so that it would slow down their retreat. At the time, we loved wine so much, so we made do because we're known as being resourceful people. Massimo's family probably made one of the worst wines in the time we all did. <laughs> and we were all forced to drink this wine, and which is the reason why now, when we've rediscovered these wines, which his fa father has done, and has found a way to bring back the beauty of once, once time oh, they're, they're, yes. that, These wines are much better than the wine that you may have tasted in the Oh 50s. my God, there's no comparison. Yeah, yeah. But let me just tell you, we were making wine in a very simple way because, as you said, after the Second World War, we actually didn't really have uh, a scientific reference, you know, so we didn't know what to do. So we were trying to figure out what to do. So we started in the 50s, you know, to to discover the new techniques, the modern techniques, in order to make a good wine. And uh, so, of course, it took time, because by the time you plant the vineyard, and you wait at least 15 years in order to have good grapes, and then you want to vinify them, and you want to age them, because those are you know, grapes which have the structure and the strength to be aged throughout the years. So, I mean, you have 30 years which have gone like that. <laughs> So Massimo, the mountain that you're talking about that was given back to the Bourbons, tell us about the Ponte Latone plot and how that came to yeah. wind up in your hands. Yeah. And did Iris have, has Iris ever seen this hunting ground? Uh, I don't know. You should ask her. I mean, I Would remember my uh, aunt and my uncle and my father taking you all around the yeah. places. You know, so she must have been there because that was the place where the Bourbon kings used to hunt. So, and there was, you know, a pretty old, ancient uh, farmhouse where the Bourbon kings used to stop, you know, and rest. Because don't forget that Ferdinando IV, uh, when he became king, he was just seven years old. So, and he was all actually living in Caserta, in the royal palace of Caserta, and uh, they were taking him all around the places because he was a young kid. So that's why in the northern campaign, the Bourbon kings were always... Where traveling. is the church? It was on the top of it? A Saleucho. San Leucio. Yeah, San Leucio. Actually, San Leucio, around the church, the Bourbon Kings built the manufacturing plant. They built the house for the workers of the company, you know, of their factory. So I remember that was San Leucio. going to that church because I got a call. It was uh, Fergusto. It, I think it was the first day, of, uh, and my grandmother had passed away. We were very close, but I couldn't get out. You know how it was then, and so... I went to the church and lit a candle, I remember. It was, it was a little church at the top. St. Sylvester, maybe. Maybe it could have been St. Sylvester as well. St. Sylvester is the mountain that was given to us, you know, for, by the Savoia for 99 years. Which is the patron saint of Caserta. Yeah. But let's get back to Ponte Latone. Yeah. Because I think, you know, Caserta, you have great roots there with the Bourbon King, but your Ponte Latone plot of land is off the Via Appia. And the Via Appia is an old Roman highway, exactly. which brought people exactly. from Rome to Brindisi. Yeah. And along the Via Appia, there's lots of Roman ruins. In fact, very close to your vineyard, there's more Roman ruins than there probably are exactly. in the San Leocho area. Exactly. And in that area, I also know there's a, there's a little church in Sant'Angelo in Formis called the Byzantine Church, which is 900, was built in 900 based on an, uh, based on a Roman temple to, exactly. to I think, Diana. Mm -hmm. And the village that my parents come from, Bellona, is the name of a Roman goddess of war. Yeah. So on the other side, you have this Ponte Latone, which was known as Caleonum by the Romans, and you have both limestone and volcanic. Exactly. So let's talk more about the Bacnalian background yeah. of what you have now 
because I think what you have now is a tremendous treasure, more so than the actual silks of yesterday. Oh, yeah. So, uh, don't forget that the Bourbon Kings are the ones who started to excavate Pompeii. So, this, they found Pompeii, and so that's, the, it's under their, you know, uh, kingdom, you know, that they started to resurrect Pompeii. So, they knew that Pliny the Elder, you know, the pretty famous historian, historian was making reference to the 2,000 years ago to the area where we are, because a chapter 14 of this big encyclopedia, which talks about wine and geography and food, uh, they were, he was making reference to the area where we are, saying uh, three are the good areas, you know, where they produce good wine. One is Falernum, the other one is Caulinum, the one you were mentioning, and the other one is Trebulanum, the Ager Trebulanum. So the Bourbon kings knew that. So that's why they resurrected all the indigenous varietals of the area and they planted them, you know, in their royal vineyard. And in Ponte Latone, actually, 30 years ago, they could find these big prephyloxera trees from which the professors of the university took the cuttings to repropagate in that area, in the area where the Bourbon Kings used to hunt and live, actually. So the area is pretty interesting because of the soil, as you said. So it's uh, volcanic soil. It's, uh, it's pretty interesting because in the 20,000 uh, 20, uh, years ago, you know, after the big eruption of Campi Fregre, all the area was covered by ashes. And these ashes then, they, through the years, they came down the valley where we are. So all the soil that we have are volcanic soil. So because we are pretty close to Mount Vesuvius. So I think this is one of those reasons why the vineyards really, you know, they can, they, they developed and they can really grow, you know, in a, in a proper way, in a healthy way, because of this pretty interesting soil. So I have a question for both of you, which is, um, how does it feel to be here in the offices of the Wall Street Journal and um, remembering the stories of your past, your families? Uh, how does that feel for both of you? It's interesting. It's wistful. I'm thinking of so many little flashbacks, like sitting at lunch during one of the long siestas, Angelina's, fa oh my God, fabulous lunch. And at the time, Frank Sinatra's record of... Uh, Strangers in the Night, all the Italians were crazy about it, and they kept playing it over and over and over. It was, I just can't get that out of my head. And lots of, lots of things. I remember the mozzarella, and, and uh, Raffaele had a good friend who had a laboratorio to make mozzarella, and he used to make it for us in little bite size. And every time <laughs> we left, from, from Naples to go back to, to New York, they would come to the boat with big crocks of the mozzarella. And you know, you're not allowed to bring it into the country, so they let us take it aboard. And I used to spend my whole dinner hour on the ship going on peddling this mozzarella, please eat some, because what am I gonna do with it? It was so, so delicious, so delicious. Nowadays, you can get that same mozzarella which comes from a lot of the uh, places they call the Latticini Freschi. And a lot of them are along the Via Appia, not far from his vineyard. I and um, you could get them at Italy. Oh, I don't go there. I've not, you know what? Oh. I've never been there. I always want to go. Italy. No. You could even buy it online probably from Citarellas. <laughs> <laughs> well, you could buy it There's online if you know how to do it. There is a, 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 a I, little town called Vidulazio, which is next to this, so on uh, the other side of the hill? The other side of the hill, and on, in Vidulazio, on the Via Appia, there are okay. two good... The, yeah, I solved my problem by discovering Burrata, which I like ah. better, so yeah. I get that. It's a that. little richer. The, yeah, so but, you have very good taste. So but it's, mozzarella it, is not as rich as the Well, burrata. mozzarella sometimes, as my husband would say, tastes like uh, uh, foam rubber. If you get the wrong one. But, you but know, the, the, the difference is when you go to Caserta, you go to Ponte de Torres, and now you have to go. You have to get on the next plane and go visit. And uh, he'll, uh, he'll I will come and pick you up mozzarella. with my carriage and oh, yours. Oh, goody, goody. <laughs> he'll treat oh. you to mozzarella. Yeah. Because I remember Carl saying, you know, while it, when I was 
when we, we were working together at the D&D building, I remember he, him telling me the story about my grandfather coming with, my, with his carriage and with his horses at the train station in Caserta because actually we were coming from Civita Vecchia, you know, by train. And he was coming to pick you up with that. So that's a little, I mean, it's pretty hilarious. They would know. go by horse and carriage from Caserta to Civita Vecchia. No, no, from Caserta to San Leucio. Because they were coming from Civita Vecchia by train, that's what Carl was I telling see. me. And then they were picked up in Caserta, going to San Leucio, up to San Leucio. Well, the, fir the very first time we went to uh, Caserta was with a competitor of yours. Uh, uh, who was his? his uh, we have uh, Bologna, as you mentioned. No. And the other is De Negri. De Negri. Yeah. It, it, Those are the three family. It was the son who was, it was a doctor. Exactly, yeah. And he came, yeah. he had a new Mercedes. Yeah. And he was a speed demon. And he was going so fast, I thought I was scared to death. So I was sitting in the back, I tapped him on the shoulder, and I couldn't speak a word of Italian then. And I tried to make him understand that I wanted him to slow down. So he said, and he reached in, <laughs> and he handed me a box of Dramamine. <laughs> <laughs> I never thought I'd get there alive. But you did. And here you are. <laughs> and how, did it, how does it feel for you? Yeah, I remember for us, as I said, it was a big party, a big feast. So we were really, whenever we knew that they were coming over, we wanted to be, you know, we wanted to be involved around the table. And, uh, and you know, it was good because there was, it, it, it was business, but on the other side, you know, it was a good human uh, relationship because we were staying with them for, you know, for a pretty long time. It was not just a day or just a few hours like, you know, it happens today that, you know, in a few hours and few minutes you just burn what you are doing, you know. But we were staying together for a couple of weeks. So I remember that was, you know, pretty... Yeah, pretty, pretty good for us. I think that comes from just loving what you do, right? And having it be part, like, organically of who you are, as Iris was saying about how um, her life, her professional life, and her personal life were one they, with, with uh, Carl. They, they were integrated completely. And uh, I think that that's, um, it's, that's actually how the richest experiences in life are, is when, is when our work and our personal life meld together and give us such uh, richness and pleasure. It was amazing how much we accomplished with language, or even though there was a language barrier. Mm -hmm. But I learned again, the first day I was in Caserta, we went to, uh, I don't remember, it was almost somebody's mill, and they got a, um, they couldn't speak a word of English, and I couldn't speak a word of Italian, so they got an interpreter. I'll never forget him. He was, a, it was very short. He had red hair that was graying. It was parted in the middle. It was like this. He had little uh, Benjamin Franklin eyeglasses, and he had a little um, dictionary, Italian English dictionary. And he was always going, but he couldn't find any of the textile words. <laughs> I mean, it was just useless. But he was consoling himself. I'll never forget this either. He had a cucumber in his pocket. And he would, every time he thought nobody was looking, he would take, the, take some cucumber and look at the book again. And we got no place, but I found out then that if you're passionate about something, you can really communicate without, without words. And we, we really got on. We understood one another with texture and color and everything else. It was a very interesting yeah, despite experience. despite the language barriers. You exactly. Know? Yeah, yeah, that's really Exactly, because Raffaele never learned English. Yeah, I mean, just my uh, uncle, Franco, he learned English during the, when the Americans were yes. there, you know, because they stayed there a couple of years, you know, and so... But he wasn't English. always around. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, I mean, we managed, so... Yeah, yeah. He learned uh, English from American soldiers. So American soldiers. He <laughs> knew a lot of the little, <laughs> the little songs that they would sing. Um, well, today, uh, David? Yeah, this is, uh, I, 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 I wanted to wrap it up, but I, you know, t today was really more about people on the brink of discovery. And Iris, for you to go to an area of Italy like that after the war in the 50s, 
where the local dialect is extremely difficult to understand by any foreigner. And to find the beauty in the area um, is something that I very much respect about what you've done. And Massimo, what you are doing in the area right now to bring back the heritage and the biological aspect of, of your vineyard, I was very impressed with your vineyard. And I think that often in times people ask me, you're from Campania, oh, you're from Napoli. They get very confused, they don't know the various areas. And they say, I'm going to Naples, or I'm going to Capri, or they say Capri. They say, I want to visit a local vineyard. So I thought it would be right for me to visit one of these local vineyards first before I was actually ever giving there, the advice. Are there, are there many? There are others. There are others. There in, in the area that uh, Massimo's family is, has their vineyard is known as uh, Terra del Volturno because um, it's, it's most of the, 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 the irrigation comes from the Volturno River. River. Um, and there is an, there's another vineyard not far from there that's actually known as Terre del Volturno that does a very good Pellegrillo. Yeah. Um, and the area was originally known for Solopaca grapes, however, for many, many years. And then Massimo's family rediscovering the actual Pellegrillo grape and the Casa Vecchia grape is a great feat of our heritage going back to Pliny in ancient Rome. Mm -hmm. But there's other areas of Campania, like Avellino, that does phenomenal archaeological wines that actually was the forefront of putting a lot of these Greco-Roman wines onto the market with Fiano di Avellino and Greco di Tufo and another one called Calazzi. Aglianico, Calazzi. which Aglianico yeah. is a translation from Greek meaning Hellenico, so it was more of a <laughs> Greco wine that the Greeks planted in what was known as Magna Grecia. Exactly. Is, is Falangina from the same yeah, region? Yeah, Falangina is. is a varietal of Fiano di Avellino. Yeah, now, yeah. we're not from Avellino, which is another province in Campania. We're from Caserta, which is the one time known as province of Napoli before the war. Mussolini had the foresight to make it its own province. Um, but we also, we, we also grow Fiano and Falangina in the area, and actually the whole area going up north towards Rome along the Palatina. You'll see Falangina and mozzarella stores everywhere. But um, what I found very attractive about your vineyard is the roots that you've discovered, the beauty of it, and how well you're maintaining it. And I um, recommend the vineyard to anyone who travels to Napoli if you have time, go to Caserta, visit Massimo. They'll open up the doors for you, and you'll get the royal treatment, and you'll feel like a bourbon king. Well, thank you all for coming together yeah. today. But let me just express my gratitude, you know, for being here today. Thank you, Iris. I really my appreciate pleasure. That. Thank you. Really honored. It was great Thanks fun. Thank Thanks you. Nice to see you again Thanks after all these years. Thanks a lot.